Um, Emlyn oversees the property management and operations and sustainability teams within AMP Capital Office and Industrial. He has over 15 years property experience and he joined AMK, AMP Capital's property business in 2006 as the head of operations and environment. It's his responsibility to deliver the best practice service to tenants in order to ensure retention and attraction is maximised. So he's in charge of um, keeping, keeping the business heads happy as well. He's also responsible for ensuring continual evolution of assets to optimum sustainability performance, managing their operational risk and safety. Emlyn is also the co-chair of the City of Sydney's Better Buildings Partnership. And he's here to talk about what they're doing for bikes. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am indeed here to talk about uh, end of trip facilities. And I guess my objective, or my main objective, my main thought when Rebecca asked me to do this was how I was going to keep people entertained for 20 minutes while I talk about bike racks and change rooms, effectively. But I'm going to give it a crack. <laughs> so here we go. Um, I'm going to give an introduction to the company, but I'll make that really short, or you really will be asleep. Um, why end a trip facilities in the workplace? Uh, the scale and design of them. So I'm going to show you some pretty pictures of our end of trip facilities. Uh, I'll talk about the investment, and then I will uh, talk about some of the lessons we've learned in actually the, des the design and the practice of these facilities. Uh, very quickly, then, uh, I think most people would know of AMP. It's been around for 160 odd years in Australia, which for an Australian company is is quite a tenure. Um, I actually work for uh, real estate, so on the bottom of that page there, and um, we have a substantial holding in real estate, you know, sort of $16 billion, which uh, means we're a big player in real estate, but in the scheme of things in A&P, we're only about 3 or 4% of the actual uh, the empire, which is sort of 5 million customers. But we did build Australia's first high-rise back in uh, 1963, uh, the 33 Alfred Street Tower, and we're very proud of the fact that we built it. We've owned it ever since, and we've lived in it ever since. And it's evolved through various uh, iterations of life and uh, the, the style of, of working from closed little offices to obviously open style. But uh, we still have some of the old heritage pieces in that building. And in fact, we'll be opening it up to the Open Sydney Festival soon so people can sort of wander through it and take, take a look. But it's, uh, it's certainly stayed the, t stayed the test of time. Uh, that's the world and we have some offices there, so that's enough of that. Um, <laughs> these are some of the buildings that we own and manage, and they're just a selection of them. But I just picked these ones as we have end of trip facilities and all of these assets. And they go from Collins Place, which is 1982, to Burke Place, 91. NAB was about 95, 96, and Angel Place about 99. So a, a sort of a cross spectrum, everything from a 100,000 square meter office tower with uh, that Collins Place has also got the Sofitel, a very large 360-odd uh, room hotel. OK, so why, why would we uh, get into end trip facilities? Well, Sylvia already talked about the use of cars and, and the decline in people using cars in the city. And as much as some of our media would tell us that people are not cycling and the decline in cycling, um, I can tell you now that it was the number one tenant request um, looking for office space in the city. The number one request, and that doesn't mean they care for it more than air conditioning, but we've all got air conditioning, and the trip facilities. And it's not end of trip facilities which are um, sort of the old dingy two shower with socks and drawers hanging off the side of them. This is really supposed to be high-end facilities that people can interact with. And that's what I'm hoping to show you, uh, what we've created. Um, we wanted to foresee this. We, we installed the, the NAB facility uh, nearly four years ago. Um, the market was a bit healthier now, but we've got, um, well, we've got about 6% vacancy nationally. But you're talking about every city now hitting 10% plus vacancy. So your point of difference is extremely important. Uh, sustainability ratings have been uh, around for some years, but getting stronger and stronger in their impact on valuation. So, um, the reason we put them in is, is, is that we aspire to be the number one uh, tenant provider. And if that's what tenants want, then that's what we need to provide. And I'll just touch upon that a little bit more as we go through the, the economics of it. Um, but a drop in car demand is absolute. Our, as you'll see a couple of these that I show you, we've got 
sort of 10, even 20% vacancy in our car parks that no longer is a, is a car spot an automatic perk for an executive. Um, it's now part of a salary package and people can do without it and take public transport because, uh, well, mostly because they don't want to sit in the traffic for as long as, as long as they have, but certainly that healthier lifestyle and that work balance lifestyle comes into it too. Uh, again, and I'll just touch upon that as we go through, but the community engagement, um, you know, if you're going to get planning, then you're going to have to do, um, uh, uh, you're going to have to participate in the development of the city and the City 2030 plan. We're trying to uh, develop all the time and enhance our assets and if we can uh, you know, create some extra uh, net lettable area by installing facilities or the likes then that's what we will do but that car, car demand means that we actually have that drop in car demand we have got vacancy in our car parks as I said and we have got then a drop of use and dead space in a, in a tower that's worth sort of you know, over half a billion dollars uh, you've got to do something with it and there's not a huge amount you can do with basement, uh, uh, basement car parks but Installing really top-end end-of-trip facilities is one that you can. Uh, put in here, evolve to enhance value. That's to ensure that your asset is always relevant. And if tenants are looking for something, you've got to try and provide it. And you've got to keep your assets evolving, no matter whether they're 100% leased or not, because it will impact uh, your valuation based on, on vacancy risk. That if you don't have facilities, and that's what people are after, then uh, you will have valuers projecting out um, uh, more of a vacancy risk that impacts your bottom line and, uh, and I'm the one that gets asked why we didn't uh, keep up with the Joneses. So um, look this is 35 Collins Street in Melbourne that's the, the building that was on the left the one with the hotel in it uh, but this is purely for uh, office staff um, so I've said convenient integrated and safe um, I'm really talking there that uh, there's obviously pedestrians there's loading docks there's all sorts of activities going on in the building um, and we want to provide uh, access straight off the street um, and be able to uh, ultimately come off a cycleway um, and come straight into the asset, uh, go down and know that uh, uh, your bike, which is uh, uh, often very, very valuable, is, is safe. Um, but I also mean uh, safe insofar as um, the use of facilities, and I'll, I'll just talk about that in a moment. But We've also installed these uh, maintenance facilities so that you've just got uh, puncture repair, uh, you've got uh, oil station, bits and pieces, chain management tools, things like that uh, within the, within the lockup area. And these are, you know, these are far cry from the, the dingy uh, end of trip or, or shower and communals. But, um, you know, what have we learned here? Um, it's really got to be the top end finish. It's not... Um, it's not just uh, cyclists that are using these facilities, but it's people more and more doing Oztag at lunchtime or going out for jogs, uh, coming in in the morning. Um, some of the things that we've put in here, I've put in spacious and well ventilated. The ceiling height is very, very important. The old ones used to be sort of down in the basement and it all feels very uh, uh, claustrophobic and, and actually the humidity, so high ventilation. Uh, will maintain the finishes in this regard. You've got to have cleaners coming in and out a few times a day, so that feeds the, uh, the employment as well. We have active service and maintenance, you know, soaps, towels, the things we all experience and get frustrated when we go into uh, uh, facilities that are not kept up to date. Oops, excuse me. Uh, you did tell me the one thing that I needed to do. I didn't do it. Um, so we've also got um, things like towel dryers so that people can um, uh, leave them in there during the day um, and they're not then putting wet towels into bags that they're, that they're uh, taking home in the end of the day. So this is just some of the uh, economics of it. Um, in this particular case, we had old storerooms. I mean, you've got now uh, plant rooms that uh, just don't require, you know, you can imagine an old telephone exchange will now, you know, needed two rooms back in 1963 and now needs, you know, uh, a very small cupboard. So we can convert this into uh, these end-of-trip end facilities. Um, but they're not cheap. This is our most premium one. It's only just finished, but $1.7 million. Now, I don't have a business case that says, give me $1.7 million and I'll turn that into $20 a square meter in rent. But as I said, it's all about attraction, minimizing vacancy, um, and uh, you know these facilities, because we've jumped ahead a bit, we do have a point of difference. 
Um, because we've jumped ahead a bit, people are talking about them. People are, agents are bringing them in and out of the, uh, bringing uh, uh, um, tenants in and out of the facilities. Uh, I get to come and do talks about them, and that just uh, flies the brand and flies the flag for that asset. Um, by parking in this, in this particular precinct, it was 186 bays, and we didn't have vacancy because they have the hotel, but I'll talk to you about uh, some of the others that certainly do. So 50 Bridge Street in Sydney. Um, the only thing we extra introduced here was a towel service. So this is like the really premium end, and this means that you don't have to bring your own towel. You can come, pick it up, throw it into a bucket, and, uh, and, and off you go. Uh, 20K an annum sounds like a lot, but the outgoings, the operational expense of that asset's over $2 million a year. So in the big scheme of things, when people uh, really start to talk about the facilities and come back to you and say, wow, we're loving these new facilities, they're fantastic, that is definitely money well spent. Why don't I just hold it in my hand? That would be a much better idea. Um, now this one, I'm, I really like this um, access way because um, cars and interacting. Um, this means you can come straight in off the street, you can sort of hold onto a bar, swipe your card, come down, roll around and go into top end uh, facilities. We had 20% uh, vacancy in the car park, so we didn't need to give up anything in here. We could have put, uh, we, in some other assets we put in, you know, the kings are secure parking, but this is a, a 35 year old asset and it's got columns everywhere to hold it up. Um, and so we just felt it would be more a case of uh, we'd be paying people for all the time to keep bumping into their columns down there. And as you park there all the time, you, you, you just get used to it. So 100 bikes, 1.5 million, but an asset value, as I said, of uh, nearly 600 million. So in the big scheme of things, it's keeping evolving to maintain that value. 600 Burke Street, again, 16.5%. Uh, you can read it there, uh, 1.5 million, 204 uh, capacity. Um, but it's not only the absolute largest uh, facilities. Um, this is a much smaller facility in the Sydney CBD, uh, 365k, and we utilised an old garbage bin enclosure and cleaners room. Um, you know, an excellent use of space. Um, we've been able to uh, reallocate uh, uh, that bin storage to a far more accessible point uh, to allow garbage trucks to come in and out of the building without knocking into people either. Um, so the last one that I'm just going to show you some pretty pictures of is 35 Pitt Street. Um, again, uh, this one we didn't use up any car spaces at all. We actually were able to create like a mezzanine level and come off the back of the loading dock. And so that one really worked out well. And even with that big structure, 450k. It's currently only got 25 park, uh, bike parking facilities, but we're going to expand that. Uh, we sort of did the parking beforehand. Now we've done the end of trip. Now that they have good end of trip, we'll get more bicycles in. And so we can therefore uh, expand expand the, uh, the number of racks. So as I come near the end, um, future facilities. And this is where I'll just spend a little bit of time talking through these. So this is just some of the, the lessons learned. Um, they are massively popular. And even though we've got um, up to 10 and 12 uh, showers, male and female, uh, we could do it even more. Um, and the more and more that these corporate games and other lunchtime activities. You've got a very, very large use in the morning, and then you've got a huge use at lunchtime. Um, ensure that the architect designer has experience in delivering similar projects. Um, and I mean end of trip. It's, um, uh, we've engaged at the start with architects that we, I guess, thought uh, understood uh, what we were looking for, but it's really having that absolute experience of what products, what materials to select, what works well, what doesn't work well. You know, a little bit down there, I've got uh, one original design. I uh, didn't have ironing boards and hair dryers, and so we installed those. Um, one of them, the bike racks were too high. So, um, you know, people that, uh, that weren't as tall as this architect couldn't get the bike up to, uh, to the rack, so we had to go and reinstall them. And, um, and not everyone is 25 who rides a bike either, so uh, as light as some of these bikes are, some people uh, are not uh, capable of lifting them up over their head as one would suggest they should. Um, one early facility, that third point there, the need to walk through the bike racks to get to the change rooms. Um, again, as people uh, use uh, the facilities for more and more activities, um, that was uh, a silly idea, um, that uh, we wanted to have them connect uh, straight into the uh, facility rather than through the bike racks. Um, 
and security for bikes um, as I said earlier on is, is paramount to the point where um, actually some of our tenants have even uh, come to us and said well we're going to give up a couple of our own car spots and build you know their own secure uh, bikes for those that are you know really riding these uh, super bikes and uh, worth a fortune and worth more than some of our cars. Um, locker use is a sensitive issue. It's a very, very sensitive issue. We couldn't believe just how sensitive it is. <laughs> we started off with eight hour use because you, you don't want people to just commandeer the locker and they cycle in once a fortnight or, or less. Um, you, you can't have that many lockers. So we started off, I think it was with eight hours. Well, that wasn't enough and we accept that. So we went with 12 hours. So I mean, after 12 hours, the thing opens up automatically. So if you've got your gear in there, well, somebody can have a free pair of runners. But um, we then went with um, uh, giving the ability to have people, uh, uh, have a small number of them assigned for permanent. Um, and if those people want to pay for that, they can. Um, but the rest of them are, are sort of open after 12 hours. Uh, some people, as I said, if they go out and maybe have a drink or two and then they want to stay the night, well, you've got to come back and take your stuff out. Um, we just throw it into a sort of a large container um, and that if, uh, <laughs> if you don't get there, you don't get there. And you might have to sieve through some pretty unsavories to find your own trainers as well. <laughs> and I've got there, you've probably already read it, that people borrow towels. That towel service is costing us a bit more than 20k a year now <laughs> because people like white towels and they tend to... Uh, they tend to take them away. Um, look, I think I've mentioned uh, everything else, but I'm going to uh, uh, sit up here at the front and, and answer any questions that you have. But these are uh, absolutely um, greatly received. They are the norm. The more that we can connect them into cycleways, we even have one building where the signage out the front, you know, the for lease signage had cycleways connected. Uh, the city of Sydney loved that and took a picture and sent it to us. Um, but um, that's more and more and more. Uh, what we will see and what we will aspire to do as we work with the, the 2030 plan. And I think that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs>